Hello and welcome to our event today. Across the globe, from Palestine to Colombia, we're seeing struggles for liberation and freedom from oppression. Today, we'll be joined by two fantastic speakers, Yara Hawari, writer and senior policy analyst at Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Yara has also recently joined us as a council member at Progressive International. Yara joins us from Ramallah today. We'll also be joined by Jeremy Corbyn, Member of Parliament in the UK, former leader of the UK Labour Party, founder of the Peace and Justice Project, and also member of the Progressive International Council. Yara and Jeremy will be discussing how we can join together to draw strength in these common struggles for liberation and how we can overcome oppression across the globe for everyone. Welcome to the anniversary celebrations of the Progressive International. The oligarchs ruling the world are pushing humanity to an existential crisis in every country, on every continent. Our choice is clear. It is internationalism or, or extinction. But while wealth and power consolidate around the world, the forces of progress remain fragmented. Nuestra misión es unir, organizar y movilizar las fuerzas progresistas in a planetary front with the strength to fight and win. Our internationalism stands against imperialism in all its forms, from war and sanctions to resource extraction. We seek good ways of living, free from hunger and want, in harmony with all species of the planet. Our internationalism is intersectional. We believe that layers of operations that run through the global economy demand that we center the struggles for food, for land, for dignity, and for liberation. Nuestro internacionalismo es feminista. Nuestro objetivo es romper con el patriarcado y terminar con las estructuras binarias de géneros en las que se apoyan. We direct our politics towards care, cooperation, and accountability. Our Facebook has now turned into a beast. Our internationalism is intimate. New technologies promise community, but so discord instead. We believe we cannot succeed unless we know and trust one another on equal terms. We welcome unions, parties, movements, individual activists, and publications wherever they may live. Together, this coalition is greater than the sum of its parts and, and powerful, powerful enough to remake the world. world. We believe that dialogue is not enough. Our activities prepare us for planetary mobilization. Matching the scale of our crisis to the scale of the action we mount against them. We believe that solidarity is not a slogan. The, the expression, expression of sympathy is commonplace. Our task is to join forces across borders in a common defense of people, people and, and planet. planet. And bend history towards justice. Join, donate, share. Today's event is part of a series of events to mark Progressive International's first anniversary. We aim for these discussions to form part of PI's agenda for the coming year. We also hope to raise enough money from these events to keep us going in the coming year. PI remains funded exclusively from small donations from people like you. So please consider donating today. Now for our speakers. Hi there, Yara and Jeremy. Yara, we will go to you first. Thank you, Anna, and thank you so much to Progressive International for inviting me to speak at this one year anniversary. I've been following PI since the beginning, and it's really amazing to see how much you've achieved in such a short amount of time and in a pandemic as well. I also want to say that it's a complete pleasure to be speaking on this panel with Jeremy, who during his time as Labour Party leader inspired so many young British people to engage with politics uh, and really helped to bring the Palestinian struggle for liberation front and centre 
to the British mainstream. Tonight, we are talking about liberation within a radical and internationalist framework. In other words, a liberation beyond nation state borders, a liberation for everyone. And I want to use Palestine as the springboard really in which to talk about this liberation because I am Palestinian, I live in Palestine, I am immersed in the Palestinian struggle for liberation, but also because Palestine is a microcosm where so many structures of oppression meet. And I think that microcosm provides us with an opportunity to develop an ideology of liberation that is truly internationalist. In the last few weeks, as many of you know, we've seen an escalation in the violent brutalization of Palestinians across colonized Palestine, from the bombardment of Gaza to the Israeli armed Setlam lynch mobs attacking Palestinians in cities such as Haifa, uh, Jaffa and Lid. Palestinians have been reiterating on mainstream media, on various platforms and in the streets that this escalation has merely been part of a continuous process of settler colonialism that has continued for the most part unfettered for over 70 years. This has seen the theft of Palestinian land, the displacement of Palestinians in their hundreds of thousands, the consolidation of military occupation, the co-option of the Palestinian leadership, and also an entrenchment of a system of economic dependence and exploitation. Palestinians are therefore not simply resisting a settler colonial regime, but all of these other systems of domination that Israel uses to keep Palestinians occupied and colonized. Now, amidst this latest ex escalation and violence from the Israeli regime, Palestinians have been rising up and mobilizing across their fragmented geographies in a momentous show of unity. Protests and demonstrations have been continuous in the West Bank, in Gaza, in the 48 lands, and at our borders with Lebanon and Jordan. And perhaps one of the most monument monumentous moments of this uprising has been the general strike, which took place on May 18th, now uh, over a week ago, which was called by people on the streets and saw massive participation. And it was particularly important for the Palestinian citizens of Israel who make up nearly 20% of the population of Israel and as such constitute a large number of the workforce. Now, to give you an example of the strike's impact, the Israeli construction industry was halted for an entire day because its workers are nearly totally Palestinian and adhered to the general strike. Now, off the back of that general strike, there was a call by Palestinian trade unions and workers' organizations across colonized Palestine to international trade unions around the world to stand in solidarity and to take immediate action in recognition that trade unions internationally have had and continue to have a proud and historic tradition of standing up against oppression and also adopting labor-led sanctions against oppressive regimes, such as during South Africa's apartheid era. And we've seen in response to this latest Palestinian uprising, that international solidarity from workers. Just to give you an example, dock workers in the Italian port of Liverno refused to load a shipment of weapons and explosives headed for Israel, stating that they would not be accomplices to the massacre of the Palestinian people. And I think this is such a beautiful example uh, of the manifestation of people power Workers around the world hold this incredible power, and it's no surprise that regimes are worried about the mass activation of that power. And so they continue to attempt to fragment us and divide us in any way possible. And we see that really in so many ways around the world. The demonization of brown and black immigrant workers in European countries, for example, have convinced some white working class communities that they are the enemy and not the corporations and the governments that exploit them. But I want to return to the issue of arms and weapons for a bit, particularly because it's so incredibly pertinent to Palestine. Israel is the largest per capita exporter of arms in the world, and they use Palestinians as their guinea pigs. Gaza has even been called a cash cow for Israeli arms companies. Not only do they sell arms to the Israeli government for their continuous bombardments of Gaza um, and their oppression of Palestinians elsewhere, but they can also use it as a testing ground to perfect their weapons. The horrific outcome of this over the many years has been thousands of killed and maimed Palestinians. Now, over the last few decades, 
Israel has exported arms to over 130 countries, including many regimes with horrific human rights records. In the last few weeks, for example, we learned that a co Colombian company is attempting to import the chemical weapon known as Skunk from the Israeli order tech company, which actually designed Skunk, which is this nasty concoction of chemicals that cause intense nausea, making people violently gag. And it can also actually make it very difficult to breathe. And, and this weapon has been used frequently in the last few weeks as a collective punishment tool against Palestinians, most notably in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in, in Jerusalem. Now this Colombian company was actually trying to acquire it for the Colombian police forces to use against those who were taking part in the mass protests against right-wing fascism, against capitalist exploitation and, and police violence in Colombia. And this follows, of course, a long history of Latin American regimes seeking out Israeli weaponry to oppress domestic protest and revolution. And of course, lest we forget the US's role in all of this, the US has long sought out Israeli security and weaponry for itself, which it essentially pays for in its $3.8 billion aid package a year to Israel. Indeed, after the uprisings in Ferguson in 2015 against police brutality and mass incarceration of black bodies, the local police force there added skunk water to its arsenal. But just as these oppressive regimes are connected, so too are the people that fight against them. And a few weeks ago in Ramallah, protesters were holding signs saying, from Palestine to Colombia, long live the revolution. And then this in turn saw Colombians and Palestinians in London forming an internationalist bloc at one of the large demos against the Israeli regime's attacks on Gaza. And similarly, the links between Black Lives Matter and the Palestinian struggle are being solidified and built upon every day. Indeed, the Palestinian boycott, divestment and sanctions movement built on the largest Palestinian civil society consensus in history is responsible for the forging and the reigniting of many of these internationalist things. And then it, I think really an internationalist liberty politics needs these connections. We need to understand how all of these systems operate and how they oppress us because Indeed, there are more links than we know, not only the military weapons market that I just mentioned, but also capitalist enterprises like billionaires who've been allowed to acquire masses of wealth at the expense of others, like Roman Abramovich, who also donates millions of dollars to Israeli settler organizations involved in the ethnic cleansing of Palestinian neighborhoods, such as Sheikh Shadar in Jerusalem, or the big banks that operate in Israeli illegal settlements. Indeed, colonialism and capitalism go hand in hand and perpetuate one another at the expense of indigenous, native and working class peoples. And so Palestine matters for the liberation of all of us. And liberation elsewhere also matters for Palestine. And I think every colonial, capitalist and fascist regime toppled is a win for Palestine. And I think Palestine, Palestinian liberation in itself is a win for humanity and a win for justice. We're going to hear from Jeremy Corbyn now. Thank you very much, Yara. Over to you, Jeremy. Anna, thank you very much. And Yara, thank you for what you just said and uh, solidarity and support to the Palestinian people and the heroic work that you and many others have been undertaking, not just over the past couple of weeks, but over many, many years indeed. And I just want to say a little bit of, by way of introduction that I'm sitting in front of the banner for the project for peace and justice which we founded uh, late last year and had a launch early this year our job is what it says it's about working with and uniting different organizations and different groups both globally and locally it's not in competition with anybody it's about building the collective endeavor we've got many thousands of people who have signed up for us and many thousands um, are also helping to pay for the, our project to develop and succeed. So we're working very hard in areas of media ownership because that is crucial. I'll come on to that in a moment. Working very hard on environmental issues uh, in advance of COP26, but other issues as well. We're working on economic justice and security, supporting food hubs, food banks, and so on in this country and internationally. Solidarity with those people that are trying to 
ensure they get progressive governments, but also that they get progressive societies, and which is why I'm absolutely delighted to be invited to become part of the Council of Progressive International and to celebrate its first birthday today. A little bit ahead of us, our six-month birthday comes very soon, next month. And so about PJP is working with other people and mobilizing people, but changing the narrative and the agenda and giving people the strength and confidence to fight back in adversity. And what um, Yara was just saying about the past couple of weeks and the support for the Palestinian people has been quite incredible. The global movement in support of Palestinian people. We had near on 180,000 people in London last Saturday afternoon. We had a huge number the week before when March went outside the Israeli embassy. And I saw films of massive demonstrations all over Europe, as well as I saw massive demonstrations in the USA. That is a change. That is different. And I really do believe that the size of the popular outpouring in support of Palestine has begun to change the uh, media narrative and it's made President Biden look rather isolated compared to many of his supporters or those that voted for him in the uh, November presidential election who want to see the US adopting a completely different approach towards Palestine but no doubt we'll come on to that in, in discussion. But just to say that um, I was honoured to be invited to speak at the demonstrations in London. And um, I said to people last Saturday, don't stop, don't rest, don't go away, because this is a ceasefire. It's not a peace. It's a ceasefire. And that's all it is. And obviously, that is far, far, far better than anybody bombing anybody else. But... It has to be accompanied by justice for the Palestinian people. And we'll come on to that in discussion as well. There are many issues facing the world. I can think of um, three straight away. Climate, COVID, and the need for change, the three Cs. Because if you look at the issues of environmental degradation, the issues of pollution, the loss of biodiversity, and the growing problem of global warming and melting ice caps around the world, then it's pretty obvious that something has to be done about it. It won't be fixed by a free enterprise solution. It won't be fixed by turning and running away from it. It will only be fixed if we get a more just and sustainable and I would argue, socialist world. Because we're exploiting resources for profit and waste rather than need, because there are many people, millions, who are in effect environmental refugees. Some of the 80 million people around the world are in fact environmental refugees. And so it is about sustainability, but it's also about changing the way industries and services and people lead their lives, but not threatening the living standards of those who work in industries that are themselves quite polluting. So it is about investment, public investment, community investment, the free enterprise system. And if you read the financial papers, they'll keep telling you that uh, Every global corporation is now signed up to a green agenda. They want to see a sustainable world. I'm sure individually many of them do want to see a sustainable world. But the reality is you have to have an economic system that not just protects but improves the living standards of the poorest at the same time as bringing about environmental sustainability. It can be done. But if at the same time we're promoting um, global free market economics and an insatiable appetite for sending more and more goods greater and greater distances around the world, then the pollution levels are going to continue to rise, the carbon emissions will continue to rise. So it is an attitude, it is a state of mind. And I was very proud in the last election in the UK to put forward a manifesto commitment for a green industrial revolution. And uh, we got enormous levels of support from very concerned and conscious people and people working in heavy industry that could also see the value of what we were saying. And so when 
The COP conference comes later this year, will be there, as I'm sure Progressive International and many others are going to be there, arguing for global justice. It's not the poorest people in the poorest countries in the most disadvantaged parts of the world that have made the world a polluted place it is. It is the wealthiest people in the wealthiest countries that have promoted the dirtiest industries in those countries. And that has to be a climate justice programme that goes with it. The corona crisis has shown us just how um, unstable a world is where people are denied health justice. The uh, novel virus appeared in the early part of last year. The right, uh, I'm, here I'm sort of uh, paraphrasing the right into Donald Trump and Boris Johnson. They're quite good friends. They get along very well. I'm sure they have much in common. And... Um, they were both talking unbelievable levels of nonsense about herd immunity would bring about safety for the rest of the world. Uh, the last time I looked at the issue of herd immunity, it was basically letting the weakest die that the strongest might survive. That is hardly a path to justice, and it certainly isn't any of the socialist values that I understand. And so, under pressure, a um, vaccine was developed, and the vaccine has been distributed, or has it? Yes, if you look at a map, you'll see the vaccine distribution is very high in UK, in Europe, in uh, most of the United States, and a small number of other countries around the world. Some countries, and the poorest people in those countries, will see no vaccines for at least another year or two. And in the meantime, uh, the uh, drug companies are busy protecting their patents. So the idea of getting a patent waiver, which has now gained quite a lot of support globally, is a very important step forward towards challenging the power, the power of control of the market and supply of pharmaceutical drugs to a small number of big pharma um, companies. COVID could be a catalyst for change all around the world on the back of the terrible loss of life and the disasters that have gone with it. So this global pandemic is a serious issue. The last thing I want to say before we go into discussion is something about culture and history. We're remembering George Floyd, who died a year ago, killed in real time on television by a police officer. And killed because he was a black man who was out on the street and he was arrested and he was killed. That kicked off a massive reaction which the already existing Black Lives Matters movement um, developed very rapidly from. A Black Lives Matters movement isn't just one of solidarity and sympathy with people who are suffering from unaccountable police officers and their behavior. It is about perceptions of people, their lives, community and history. And that opening up of a serious discussion about the history of the United States, about the history of colonialism, about the history of European expansion and about the social attitudes that go with the kind of history that many of our children, particularly in Western industrial countries, are taught, which does not give them a sense of global solidarity, instead tends to encourage an exaggerated form of nationalism, which can very rapidly morph into a very unpleasant racism towards the rest of the world. So the study of history, the understanding of where our knowledge has come from, where our music comes from, where our literature comes from, where our science comes from, where our medicine comes from, where the inventions come from, is something that is actually quite important. And uh, I think the cultural arguments and battles that are going on at the present time are not sort of cheap shot things about woke or non-woke as the lazy media often portray them are actually quite serious discussions about the kind of world we want to bring up our children into and so it is about uh, encouraging people to think wider and think bigger which is why i was again in our manifesto proud to put forward 
a funding scheme for arts and culture in all our schools as a way of encouraging that wider thinking. So we don't put people into boxes and separate them off. We actually look at things in a more global and holistic way. We have a very rich global history of resistance. To those that took part in the in revolutions in Europe in the 17th century, in this country where we had the English Civil War and the rise of the levelers, equivalents happened pretty well every country in Europe, and the growth of anti-colonial movements came from the settlements in what is now Latin America, Africa uh, and Asia. And that strength of opposition is really what brought about independence ultimately in the case of Latin America in the early, uh, early 19th century, in the case of Africa in the 20th century. And so understanding of those histories and those movements is something that empowers, empowers us all. So it is about global labor movements. It is about global labor rights. It is about global solidarity. Fast forward. Fast forward to 2021, let's organize Amazon. Let's make sure Amazon workers everywhere have a right to join a trade union and be part of that trade union. Look, let's look at the other global corporations and the rights that their workers need and deserve. And look also at the way in which um, pricing mechanisms work to mitigate against producers rather than uh, the um, those that process foods so that the lowest prices are paid to those that produce the vital immediate crop and then they don't get very much out of the processing that goes down the line. Look at what coffee growers get compared to what the coffee um, sales people get when it ends up on the on the supermarket shelves. So it is about global solidarity and PI in its one year of existence has done amazing work of solidarity with people in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Peru, and so many other places and help to inspire them. And I've done a number of global calls with PI and absolutely rate and um, uh, thank them very much for the work that they put in. So it is about all these things and it is about the liberation of people. Women got the vote in most countries because of the struggle to get it. Slavery was abolished not necessarily because of the loquacious speeches made in various parliaments in Europe, but by slaves laying down their lives that others would not be enslaved in the future. That is the rich vein of history that I want us to encourage. And I would love to see global publications by PI on all these kind of issues. So today is a time for us to discuss issues of solidarity and the immediate issues facing the people of Palestine. Under occupation since 1948, since the year before I was born, and the West Bank under occupation since the year I left school. And having had the good fortune to visit Gaza, the West Bank and Israel many times over many years, I just feel for the people there. The idea you can't freely move without being confronted by a checkpoint every few kilometres. The idea you can't leave Gaza, whatever your wishes. And the idea that you're bringing up children constantly in fear of a drone overhead or a bombardment that takes out a building or buildings or houses and kills the people within it. It's a terrible way for people to live and the mental health stress of people all over Palestine and the Palestinian refugees in Jordan, Lebanon and so many other countries is also a massive issue. So we're here today not to be frightened by these issues, not to be cowed and bowed by these issues, but to try to seek a way of understanding them and bringing people together to confront them. Thank you very much. Jeremy, you you brought up some um, some really emotive things in that last uh, that last bit, but I want to return to perhaps those those demonstrations of solidarity that we've been seeing all around the world, which have been incredibly beautiful and important for the people of Palestine in in Palestine to see that that support. 
And I think there has been a shift in the narrative in the, in the mainstream media. I've certainly um, been experiencing that, um, being asked about ethnic cleansing and settler colonialism on, on mainstream uh, US TV channels is, is definitely something that wouldn't have happened uh, a, few, a few years ago. Um, and I think the youth have uh, been uh, played a huge role in this, in, in, in pushing back those sort of traditional narratives and pushing back against the, the capitulation that the Palestinian leadership made um, several decades ago and demanding a much more holistic understanding of, of, of Palestine and, and Palestinians. And I think the key now is not to let up, not to, not to stop the protests, not to stop the, the calls to action, um, to, to translate that shift in narrative to, uh, to immediate action. Um, because what is happening now in Palestine is that after several weeks of mass mobilization and protest, Israel was going on a massive campaign of arresting activists, Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, who've been involved in the mobilization. And similarly, the, P the PA, the Palestinian Authority, has also uh, been conducting its its own arrests. So I think it's key to, to keep up the momentum to support Palestinians on, on the ground here in, here in Palestine. And I, I'm often faced with this question um, from people outside, you know, how can we help? And, and often they feel incredibly um, overwhelmed. And, and I think there are key asks that are very useful in guiding people and how they can help the Palestinian uh, struggle for liberation. Of course, respecting the, the boycott, divestment and sanctions call, which is uh, a call from the Palestinian civil society. Um, recognizing calls from Palestinian trade unions is, in, is incredibly important. But just so, just a point that so people don't feel completely um, overwhelmed. I think this is where internationalism comes in um, uh, useful as a, uh, as a politics and as a, uh, as a practice, as a, as a life practice. I think it helps us get over this feeling of being isolated and overwhelmed and not being able to do anything um, in the face of all of the world's problems, um, in the face of capitalism, in the, in the face of the destruction of our environments, in the face of colonialism, police brutality, etc. And, and I think recognizing that these structures uh, of oppression all work together it helps us understand that if we we fight one of them, um, we are contributing to fighting all of them. And I think you know, supporting Palestinian action is important, but just as important is changing local politics wherever you are, because the Palestinian revolution cannot be sustained in a hostile in international environment. Um, uh, and so, as I said before, you know, the toppling of a fascist regime or a, a colonialist regime uh, anywhere in the world is, is a win for Palestine because at the end of the day this isn't Palestine doesn't exist in a vacuum we want the world to be at a better place we want liberation and justice for all peoples in the world uh, and 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 that can't exist or can't happen in Palestine uh, unless it happens elsewhere it's obviously part of that and uh, that's a point we made very heavily at the March last Saturday that uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, far-right racism are all disgusting, disgraceful and appallingly bad and are designed to divide us. And so it is about um, opposing uh, racism in any form. A question really for, for Yara, if you can help us with it. I've raised the issue of Britain's complicity in the um, in the occupation and the siege of Gaza, many times in the in, Brit in the British Parliament, going back for a very long time, and in particular the question of arms sales and equipment sales. And last uh, week, I asked the minister, Mr. Cleverly, to tell me in categorical terms whether any British weapons had been used in the bombardment of Gaza or in the way in which troops have been deployed into the West Bank to um, uh, prevent people protesting against the, the settlers. He couldn't give me a straight answer on that. He kept saying that all British weapons were sold in accordance with international law. Well, that remains to be seen because there is an ICC investigation going on anyway. Um, and uh, Israel has already been found to be in breach of the Fourth Geneva Convention as an occupying power and its treatment of people there. So I think he, he might have been jumping a bit ahead of himself there. But what's the feelings as far as um, 
people in Palestine are concerned about this. I mean, I think at the moment it's probably too too early to confirm specifically if British weapons um, were used in the latest assault on Gaza. But I think that's regardless. Um, I, I don't think that's entirely the point. British weapons we know have been, or parts of British uh, British weaponry, which is often the excuse that's used, have been used in assaults on Gaza. Um, and Britain has a long and historic responsibility uh, to Palestine, to the creation of the, the, the Palestinian refugees, uh, to the wiping of Palestine uh, off the map. And so I don't think it's, it, um, uh, you know, I don't think it's a, I think we can probably assume that they have been used, but perhaps we should wait to, to sort of, uh, to, to see in the, in the coming months from that. But British complicity in, in weapons uh, to, to Israel goes back a long, long way. Uh, in 1948, uh, the common uh, Palestinian narrative is that the British handed over uh, the keys to the Zionist movement, and that included the the, the military arsenal. My village in 1948, uh, Tarshiha, was bombed by British planes. My family home, where we lost 13 members of my family, was bombed by a British plane flown by a Zionist pilot. Um, and now that support has continued, that British support of Israel and of its violations of Palestinians' rights and of its br brutalization of Palestinian bodies has continued for over seven decades. But I think it's also important to, to widen the conversation. Britain is also complicit uh, in the sale of uh, weapons um, all over the Middle East. You just have to look at, at its complicity with uh, the Saudi and Arabian government and what the Saudis are doing in Yemen. And I think it's always important to, to widen the discussion and not just talk about Palestine, but talk about what is going on in the Middle East in, in general with regards to weapon sales. The recent normalization agreements uh, between Israel uh, and the Arab countries were not peace deals. They were weapons agreements. They were signing weapons agreements and security deals. Uh, and this should be incredibly worrying to everyone who, who is concerned about human rights abuses in the Middle East and beyond, because these countries that sign deals are guilty of human rights violations domestically uh, uh, and abroad. And yet they were being lauded uh, not only by the US uh, and Israel and its allies, but also by the European Union as a, as a move towards peace. So I think... Um, I think definitely military is something, uh, the military trade is definitely something that we need to focus on. And there's definitely a lot of room uh, to put pressure uh, in the UK, considering that many factories, there are many factories that, that produce those weapons, such as Albert systems that, that are located in the UK. Bombs to Saudi Arabia do, is direct into the bombing of Yemen and the re-emergence of cholera and all manner of uh, wholly preventable diseases in Yemen because of that bombardment. Whenever I've raised these issues in the British Parliament about sale of arms to um, Saudi Arabia, I'm given two answers. One is that Britain is uh, providing lots of aid to help the um, uh, reconstruction of Yemen and provide aid to, for the health needs of Yemeni people. Well, fine, but it'd be even better if we weren't bombing it in the first place. Um, through the British weapons via Saudi Arabia. Um, the argument is then used that um, this supports um, the economy in this country and supports jobs in this country, and therefore we have to keep on making these weapons. I simply say this, that we need to move the economy on into one that is production for productive need rather than production for uh, arms sales um, and destruction. And... Uh, Saudi Arabia is one, but not the only one, of the biggest uh, arms buyers in the Middle East. And uh, the uh, pressure to build up a conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran, as well as other countries with Iran, is a very, very dangerous game indeed. I am quite prepared to be critical of the human rights record of any country anywhere. And I am, and I do, because I do think, you know, fundamentally human rights have to be respected anywhere, whatever one um, thinks of the situation or the government concerned. Um, and therefore, 
I think we should be concentrating on those issues rather than promoting a uh, conflict with Iran. And I think we should rapidly return to the um, nuclear accords that were originally reached, which um, under which Iran stopped the development of um, enriched uranium ultimately into plutonium, which could, of course could eventually be used for a nuclear weapon. Uh, I don't want to see nuclear weapons anywhere in the world. I don't want to see them in this country either um, come, to, come to that. But it is about that kind of peace process. And I thought it was interesting on the people that turned up, uh, turned out on demonstrations over the last uh, few weeks. They are very well aware of the arms deals that have been done. The big one is the al Nimani arms contract, which Tony Blair signed with um, Saudi Arabia. Absolutely massive contract, which has now gone on for more than 10 years and continues to supply weaponry to Saudi Arabia. At the same time, doing precious little about the very bad human rights record in Saudi Arabia, the lack of respect for women's rights, for migrant workers' rights, for labor rights, and, and so many other things. And that's kind of um, all a bit ignored by most of the Western media. And the way in which the political process um, is often um, damaged, corrupted even, by um, politicians from all over the world, but particularly Western Europe and the USA, uh, traveling to Saudi Arabia and being told everything is improving and it's wonderful. Saudi Arabia has massive, massive problems and my heart is with the Saudi people and with the migrant workers who actually uh, are the ones that generate the wealth in the Saudi economy. Many of them are, of course, Palestinians, as there are everywhere all over the region, wherever you go, and I've been in many countries all over the region, what do you find? Palestinians doing all the work, skilled, able people, and all of them want to contribute to the reconstruction of Palestine and can't get home. Jeremy, I'm, re I'm, I'm glad that you brought up British complicity in Palestine, because I think that's something, the, the historic complicity, that's something that a lot of average British people don't know about. It's certainly not taught in schools. I, um, I left Palestine at sort of secondary school age and, and studied in a uh, in, a, in a secondary school in Britain, and it was not part of the curriculum, and neither was any British colonialism for that matter. And that's and that's something that I was thinking about when I was talking about uh, uh, Britain's role in in Palestine uh, and this complete erasure of of, of of Britain's crimes around the world. And um, and and it's I think it's particularly important considering that so many people. Um, that live in Britain have suffered uh, at the hands of those crimes in, in some in one way or, or another, um, particularly the, the, the immigrant communities in in the UK, um, uh, and and I don't know if you have done much work on that, um, but I think it's it's always been a, a something that's stuck and something that I've always thought about, uh, and I know there is a push now to sort of to to, to de de develop curriculums and, and to teach those things more in schools. And that push is coming from the likes of uh, Black Lives Matter UK uh, uh, and other um, uh, sort of decolonized curriculum uh, movements. Um, and this sort of also links into the issue of the, the, the statues that were being torn down as well across the UK. Um, but I think that that is part of a huge uh, shift if we want to think about an internationalist politics, we have to recognize our own country's complicity um, in oppressing others all around the world. And that's something that Britain has consistently failed at doing. There was a growth in the understanding of Britain's colonial history through the foundation of the movement of colonial freedom, which built on the um, African and South Asian diaspora that had been in Britain for a very long time. And I don't know if you've ever seen it, there's um, a, a wonderful photograph of the 1945 um, Pan-African Congress that was held in Chalton Cum Hardy in Manchester, in Greater Manchester, uh, which was a coming together of the many African liberation movements. And Krumah in Ghana, what later became independent country of Ghana and others were all there. And on the stage, there's a poster which says, um, 
Arabs and Jews unite against British imperialism in Palestine. And it, quite an uh, interesting, uh, iconic thing. And what that conference did was pave the way for people coming together for the huge uh, African independence struggles. Was any, is any of that taught in British schools? No. Is the um, Congress of Berlin of 18... Uh, uh, 88 is it 1884 sorry which um divided up africa and drew all those lines on the maps between european colonial powers um yet we were all taught about the congress of vienna of 1815 because that brought stability to the monarchies of europe because that's what that was about and so there are those kind of issues and uh, I think the teaching of history, particularly at a secondary school level, is often very bad. University level is very different because people are choosing what they study there and um, I, that, that's a totally different thing. But it's the understanding that young people get of history and the empowerment they get from understanding history that is so important. And uh, I, um, in a personal way, love visiting primary and secondary schools and discussing uh, attitudes of history with young people, but it's got to change. And uh, I think the projects, Progressive International and ourselves and others can and will do a lot more on this, uh, promoting ideas, because that in turn will pressurise for change in the curriculum. I get quite worried about the um, way in which history is taught in so many countries, including the USA, which um, often seems in denial about anything that happened in pre-Columbia in, in, the, in, in the Americas. Whereas in Mexico, which um, obviously was occupied by the Spanish, and uh, they gained their independence in 1820, um, there is a very strong understanding of the strength of pre-Hispanic Mexico and the sense of civilization that was there. You don't find the same understanding uh, north of the border in the USA. And anyway, um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the thing that's always struck me about visiting West Bank and Gaza is the huge level of understanding that people have of their own history. And in Gaza particularly, where there is much worse unemployment than on the West Bank and because of the siege and, and so on, yet there are vibrant places of learning in universities. There must be a sense of enormous frustration amongst young people all over Palestine whose whole lives have been one crisis to another. I and mean, I'm thinking, we're in one now, there was Operation Cast Lead, and then you think back and back and back, uh, one crisis after another, usually at two or three year intervals. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a common Palestinian joke that there are more PhDs than Palestinians in Palestine, <laughs> um, because the Palestinian people are an incredibly educated people, um, and education is held in, in in great high esteem, as it is with many um, many communities, many actually oppressed communities around the world. It's sort of seen as a uh, as a ticket uh, or or a way out. Uh, and of course, the situation in Gaza is is different to the rest of Palestine because it has been under that crippling siege for so long. Um, and most people, most young people in Gaza are unemployed, uh, and yet most of them are incredibly uh, skilled uh, uh, and capable of so much. Um, and, and they can't get out because the siege dictates every aspect of their life. It dictates whether they can leave or not. They have to essentially apply uh, to Israel to get permission to leave, and most times it's denied. Um, and so it is quite literally uh, a, a, an open air, air prison. Um, and the, you know, in the West Bank, the situation is slightly easier, but it's also it's still under military occupation. There is um, a lot of um, um, uh, of uh, unemployment and limited um, opportunities, and, and this. Um, has been uh, as a result of not only the, the Israeli occupation, but also the Palestinian Authority, which has consistently failed its its people uh, in, in in more ways than, than one. And what we've seen, I'm part of what's called the, the Oslo generation, um, the, the sort of the, the young people that came after the, the Oslo Accords, which were signed in, in, in 1993. Um, and so we have lived... Uh, our lives under those accords and what we've seen since those 
uh, since those accords, it has been a total uh, breakdown and fragmentation of Palestinian society across the board. We've seen the West Bank uh, divided into areas A and B and C, which has totally bantasized Palestine. We've seen the creation of the Palestinian Authority, which is basically seen as a subcontractor uh, for the um, for the Israeli occupation. Uh, we've seen the Palestinian economy, which really doesn't exist at all, totally uh, entangled uh, and made dependent on the Israeli economy. Uh, so that you know, when people talk about sort of economic prosperity, it's done entirely uh, on the terms of the Israelis, and you can't really be economically prosperous in Palestine unless uh, you have been uh, co-opted or you've done some dealings with the Israelis. To be quite uh, honest with you. Uh, and, and it's also done something, uh, interestingly, it's also done something to Palestinian society itself. Uh, it's had this effect of individualizing Palestinian society, where once we were a very collective people, the, the spirit of the, the first intifada was uh, a collective spirit. Um, there were cooperatives, people helped each other, they organized each other. Uh, there wasn't this sort of overarching leadership um, people weren't trying to to get ahead and and uh, and trying to um, achieve uh, a sort of individual success, but slowly that has been broken down, and I think Oslo has played a huge part in that in the sort of NGOization of Palestine, where now people really um, are forced to think about individual success. Uh, there has been the sort of uh, neoliberal fiscal policies applied on the West Bank as well. So many people are now indebted. And so they they work to pay off loans for their houses and their cars, which leaves very little time to think about liberation. Uh, and this is part of the plan. It's to make life uh, difficult, to, to make survival difficult so that you're totally bogged down with it every day and so that you no longer think in the, the collective. Uh, and so this has depoliticized Palestinian society. And unfortunately, because a lot of the grassroots has been transformed into NGOs who have this huge um, reliance on, on donors, which then impose their own political agendas on, on, on these organizations. Um, we have even turned away from our, our indigenous lexicon of struggle and liberation. I think there is a shift now and we're returning, but you know, the, the, even these words, even I catch myself from, from saying things that are totally not indigenous to Palestine, that is a total NGOization of our, of our uh, radical, once radical lexicon. Um, uh, but I think that this is being pushed back against. I think with the, the increasing irrelevance of the Palestinian Authority, the every day, the realization of the total failure of Oslo, people are really pushing back against these frameworks. And I think the Palestinian youth are playing, playing a really big role in that, especially in the last few weeks, the narrative has shifted. Palestinians are, are insisting, young Palestinians are insisting that we are no longer, and we never were, only the West Bank and Gaza. We are colonized Palestine from the river to the sea and beyond. And that we recognize ourselves in all our fragmented geographies as Palestinians and that our struggle even though the the brutal violence that we face from the Israeli regime manifests itself differently in, in in our different components it's part of the same system and we collectively want an end to the same that system uh, and there was a manifesto that was put out for this latest uprising and it was called the unity and hope manifesto because we are finding ourselves increasingly unified and, and increasingly hopeful right um link up with people all around in other countries and do you have much contact with any of the left or human rights groups in israel who i've been on some calls with and um there are a significant number of people totally appalled at the way their government is behaving i mean do you have any contacts with them Um, obviously, the Palestinian citizens of Israel are playing a huge role in this, this uprising. Yeah. Um, the, uh, our allies who are uh, Israelis are working on, uh, on their own society. Um, but I think this moment is, for, is about Palestinian unity. Yeah. It's focused and centered on Palestinians. Um, and we have been making links internationally um, with 
uh, and these are not necessarily new links, they're also historic links because Palestine has always been a part of um, internationalist and socialist agendas, but revitalizing these links in Latin America um, uh, and in America with Black Lives Matter. And part of that success has been because Palestine is a fragmented people, because we have 7 million refugees in the diaspora who are all, all in these countries. Latin America has a huge population of Palestinians. Um, and so it is really thanks to them that we are able to make these connections and learn about other struggles so that we also might uh, support their struggle. And the more there are international demonstrations and so on, I think it encourages individual Palestinians in different places to activate themselves. And you're right, in Latin America, which I know fairly well, there are in every city, there are quite big Palestinian communities who've now got themselves well activated in those countries as well as in solidarity. And it's a very young population. Palestine is young people. And that is something that really, really hits me whenever I go there compared to, for example, Britain, which is a much older population. And so the hope is there with the young people. I feel very hopeful and optimistic at this moment, actually on the basis that there's never been such a level of understanding and solidarity for a very long time with Palestinian people. And uh, what really cheered me up no end on Saturday was that I thought two days after the ceasefire, there'd be a big drop in attendance. And in fact, it went up. We, were, we got, as I said, 180,000 people came. Amazing. Uh, and uh, they're not gonna go away. And I keep meeting people on the street who are not people that necessarily go to demonstrations at all, who just say to me, Soy last Saturday, when's the next one? That, that sort of thing. Um, do we need to bring Anna in at the moment? Because I just want to say before Anna comes back, um, and I think we're about to finish, thank you very much for this discussion. Uh, we haven't got much beyond the issues of Palestine, but in a sense, that's a kind of microcosm of what's going on around the world. And so I think, you know, if we persuade Anna Yara, would you be up for another discussion on another day where we can talk about other global movements as well so that we can develop that, that global sense of unity because that is really what it's about. And people understand what each other are doing. This technology gives us the most amazing ability to talk to each other, but we've got to be a bit cautious of the people that own and control this technology. And I think there is a case of developing our own alternative uh, forms of communication, because we've seen the way in which the global media corporations can shut down just like that. They did it to the Indian farmers, they do it to Palestinian people, and they'll do it to anybody else around the world. Anna, I've said too much, back to you, back to Yara. Jeremy, thanks so much for being in conversation with me today. It was really great. And I think, you know, you've really said everything that needs to be said in terms of what to do next. We need to keep up the momentum and not just for Palestine. This is uh, about an internationalist movement for justice. Palestine is a microcosm, but Palestine isn't the only issue. Um, and Palestinians have long supported other internationalist uh, struggles against colonialism, uh, and we will continue to do so. You're muted, Jeremy. Oh, sorry. Think of, uh, where's my mute? Anyway, think of the speeches of Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu in support of the Palestinian people. And they did that continuously, even during the years of apartheid. Absolutely. And you don't need to persuade me, Jeremy, that another conversation between the two of you is a good idea. You just set the time and we'll be there. Thank you both so much. It was an absolute pleasure to hear from you both. <clears throat> Massively inspiring. Thank you, Yara and Jeremy Corbyn. You've given us some really practical ideas for liberation in Palestine and beyond, which I hope is a conversation that will continue. All our solidarity with you, Yara, and hope for a liberated future for Palestine. Thank you for joining us. So this discussion is part of an ongoing series. There'll be further events this week with the author and activist Arundhati Roy, with the politician Andres Arauz from Ecuador and others. So please follow us on social media for details on how to sign up for the rest of the events. If you like what you saw here today, please subscribe on our YouTube channel and consider making a small donation. I will leave you now with a video 
thank you very much for joining us today and hope to see you again. Every single thing that we do at the Progressive International is funded exclusively by donations from people like you. In an annual difficult de aislamientos y dificultades económicas, hemos logrado mucho juntos. We mobilized the front lines of the democratic struggle in countries like Bolivia. Our electoral observer mission, very peaceful, orderly, hopeful voting. Ecuador. We're here at Santa Rosa de Cusabamba. And Turkey. We took on Jeff Bezos and his global Amazon empire, joining forces with dozens of movements and unions around the world, organizing strikes and protests in 12 countries, and bringing together an alliance of 465 parliamentarians on six continents. With partners in over 40 countries, we built a global wire service to counter the mainstream media, translating and publishing critical stories from struggles around the world. We built a global coalition to fight the deaths that are drowning the households and nations of the global south. And we convened scholars from around the world to develop a blueprint for debt justice. And as the pandemic rages on, we're fighting big pharma to end COVID-19 vaccine apartheid and vaccinate the world instead. The stakes of our mission are clear. Internationalism or extinction. Only the strategic alliance of progressive forces can defeat the reactionary right, defend our communities, and decarbonize the global economy. Mas não podemos fazer isso sem o seu apoio. Não aceitamos dinheiro de governos, fundos ou empresas privadas. Prestamos contas apenas a você. This week, we're celebrating our one-year anniversary with a global fundraiser, calling on friends and supporters just like you to donate and help us build the progressive movement. We set a goal of 120,000 US dollars for the long year ahead. A year that will be no less challenging than the one that preceded it. So help us get there by visiting act.progressive.international/anniversary and donate today. Build this international with us.